Good morning, church. Will you stand as we sing and lift a joyful noise to Christ, our Lord and Savior, the reason we sing? Brought me from darkness, clothed me with garments of praise. Jesus forever, song will be. I'll sing it with us. Living in freedom, taking my burden away. Jesus forever, my song will be. Faithful is 
more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Would you sing this next song with me? Praise the Lord. His mercy is more Stronger than darkness Through every morn Sins they are men His mercy is more What love could we Without bottom or shore, our sins they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness.
blood was the pain, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are men, his mercy is full. Come on, Southland, lift it up, come on. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more, stronger than darkness, through every morning, our sins they are many, his mercy is more, praise the I think that song captures it. The fact is that we at Southwood, we who are believers in Jesus, uh, are sure, are convinced that uh, we didn't deserve the love and grace and forgiveness of God, but because of his mercy, he came on our behalf and took our debt, it said, our sins. You can learn a lot about what a church believes by the songs they sing, and those songs reflect what we're all about. One of the things that Jesus did with his disciples was celebrate something called a Passover meal on the night he was betrayed. And Christians still today, all around the world, come together and share that same Passover meal to remember Jesus. And everyone who's a believer in Jesus Christ, someone who's following him, is welcome to receive communion here at Southland. So if you came in today and you uh, passed up the, the communion elements, didn't mean to, and you'd like to participate, just put your hand up and one of our servers will come by and make sure that you have communion elements so you can participate. And those of you who are with us online, we'd really encourage you to, to grab a cracker or, or juice or something like juice and join us this morning in this celebration of Jesus. Um, so as I was saying, that Jesus was celebrating this meal where they, were, they commemorated every year God saving them from this death angel that passed over the people in Egypt. And it was a time to reflect on the presence of God, the mercy of God, and his power in their lives. So during this meal, though, and it's the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat it. Do this in remembrance of me. So in the small side of your packet, you can tear it back. There's a piece of bread in there. Take that bread and eat it and remember the broken body of Jesus for you. And then a little while later, he took a cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Take and drink it and do this in remembrance of me. Take and drink. Let's pray together. Well, Lord Jesus, it would be easy to just come to you out of habit and ritual and say this is another morning where we go through the, the, the habits of our worship, but we don't want it to be that way today. And so we're bowing our heads before you, the God of the universe, deeply appreciative for this sacrifice that you made on our behalf. Your broken body, your shed blood on the cross reminds us again of how deep our sin and how wide the chasm was between us and you. And so we receive your forgiveness today and by faith want to walk with you. So we ask that you would speak life into every heart here. Help 
us all to believe and trust and follow you. Lord, we know people have also walked in this space and they're with us online carrying some heavy burdens. People need healing of their heart and their bodies. People need comfort for grief that they have in their life. There's brokenness in relationships. We're asking you to mend those. Lord, most of all, we pray that you would remind us that you're here in this place, real and present, that you love us so much. And because of that, we can follow you with joy, encouragement, excitement. So we celebrate this broken body, this shed blood, because we understand that it represents how deeply you feel toward us. Use these next few moments to encourage us, equip us, enable us to live for your honor and glory. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Come on, let's stand again. Let's continue to worship him. Paul says this in Philippians chapter 2. He says, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, have you as always obeyed, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. I know there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus, your name is power, your name is healing, your name is love, break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Your name is love. 
those in need. We give to show Jesus to our neighbors, our community, and the world. We give as an act of worship to a God who has given everything. We give because we are the church, the body of Christ, called to be a light in the darkness a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We are the hands and feet of Jesus, sharing the hope of the gospel. This is why we give. Well, good morning, Southland. So glad you're here to celebrate today with us what Jesus has given uh, to us. And, and uh, I always love looking out and seeing new faces, people here for the first time. Thanks so much for accepting the invitation to come and be part of this. That We built this space uh, not only so that we who are followers of Christ can worship him, but so we can introduce Christ to people. That's always a deep desire of our heart as well. So thanks for being here and part of this celebration. Also want to thank all of you online who've joined us today as well, whether it's because it's cold outside and you just didn't want to get uh, your warm jammies on, or... You, you're far away and uh, on vacation or, or uh, just someone who's heard about us. Thanks for being here in worship today. Now, we've, we've got a mission statement here at Southland. It's called Being and Making Growing Followers of Jesus Christ. And that really drives everything that we, we do. But we felt like it was important that we define what that is. What is a growing follower of Jesus? And so we use four G's for that. Grace, grow, give, and go. Last week, we talked about the fact that God gave us his wonderful grace when Jesus came to the world. None of us deserved it, but he offered it to us if we'll receive it. And then last week we talked about now we want to grow in that. We want to keep grow in our understanding of that and what that means and how we live our life. And now today we want to focus on one of the out outgrowths of that, that growth, and that is to give. We believe that the third G of our, of our growing, fo follow growing following of Jesus is giving. And so if you brought a Bible or have a device with the Bible on it, we're going to go to Proverbs chapter 3 today. Now here's the thing. Um, when preacher types get up, a, a lot of them come to these sermons on giving with fear and trembling. First, because they're afraid somebody new is in the room and it's going to play into all their stereotypes that all those churches want is money. And, it, and it's not like that, so just stay with me. I'm glad you're here, if, especially if it's your first time. Just stay with us. I mean, remember, we're the church that doesn't even pass an offering plate. You know, we throw a box up on the wall and tell people, you know, just to give and support your church, and, and, and that's what's important. But today, I want to unpack it a little more than that for you in terms of why we believe giving is a very important part of following Jesus. Now, if you look at Proverbs in context, the whole thing is about wisdom, King Solomon wrote most of these uh, out so that we could learn what it means to be a wise follower of God. So the first 
uh, 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 nine chapters are saying that. Hey, man, I don't know what you're pursuing in life, but chase wisdom. Go after wisdom with all of your heart. Do everything you can to get wisdom so that you can fight off the things that will attack you in your life and, and throw your life out of order. And then the next 10 to 31 chapters are all Proverbs. And the reason they did it this way is because they wanted people to memorize these Proverbs to apply them to their lives. You, you're walking down the street and you're confronted with something. You want to have that kind of, of message in your head. And this is what God wanted to do through King Solomon for the people of God so they would know how he wants them to live. So because we put all scripture in context as we interpret it, we need to know that that's the overall theme of Proverbs. But then let's back up just a few verses. I said we're going we're gonna to start in chapter 3. Here's what he says in verse 1 of chapter 3. Store my commands in your heart, for they will give you a long and satisfying life. Now, it's important we understand that so that when we lay out stuff from the Bible, we're talking about what God has to say to us on how to live. So we decide if he can be trusted, and then we make a decision whether or not, if, he's, if we trust him, that we're going to live the way he's directed us to live. And it leads to two verses that many believers have memorized in their life, and maybe you're, if you're a Christ follower today, you've memorized these two verses from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. I brought a little bit different translation today because i just like to mess you up. Here it is, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. In other words, here, here it is. This, that's the basic command of life. Seek the Lord. Ask the Lord to direct your life. And he's given you this word to do that. So pick it up, read it, and apply it. Now, there's that phrase again, though, in there. Seek him with, here it is, all your heart. Not as a hobby, not as just the religion that you've chosen among a lot of other things you've chosen in your life but rather seek the Lord with all your heart. Oftentimes when I'm talking to athletes, uh, they love to use the idea that Jesus is number one in my life. And I, and I love it when they do that because I know with their heart, that their heart's good and they mean it. But I looked at them a few weeks ago at, at some athletes I was speaking to and I said, Jesus doesn't want to be number one in your life. And they looked at me like I was, you know, crazy. And I said, no, really, he does not want to be number one in your life. He doesn't want to just be one, a, a page on the page of your life, and you do that, whatever it is your ritual is, and you get him out of the way. Jesus wants to be the page. Jesus wants to be everything in your life. Not number one in your life, but everything in your life. So when Solomon tells us that we need to seek him with all our heart, he means just what he's saying. That we need to give him all of our life and every aspect of our life, not just our religious expression in a service on Sunday, but everything we are. And in order to know the life Jesus designed for you, he's saying you got to trust him with all. Now that means not only with all you are, but all you have, all you own, all you've been entrusted with, all you've inherited, all of your time, all of your abilities. When he says all, he means all. Good job not replying to that when I left you the pause there to do it. But hang in there. We'll keep going. With that as the context of this passage now, let's focus on two verses that follow that I think will get this point across as what it is all about to give all. Look at verse 9 of Proverbs chapter 3. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Now, to talk about that verse, let me just ask you, you know Christmas is pretty unique as it relates to present buying uh, throughout the year because it's only at Christmas where we buy multiple gifts for multiple people. You know, other, we don't celebrate Easter that way. We don't celebrate Groundhog's Day that way. We don't, we don't celebrate other holidays that way except Christmas where we give multiple gifts to multiple people. If it's your birthday, you might get multiple gifts, but you're the only one it's your birthday. But at Christmas, we give lots of gifts. Now, why do we do that? Why do we give a bunch of people gifts? Well, to celebrate the fact that Jesus, Jesus wasn't only born, Jesus was actually given to the world. Given to the world. So the whole idea of gifts under the tree and giving them, giving them to one another is to say this gift reflects 
what this holiday celebration is all about, that God gave Jesus to the world. Give is in the heart of God, men and women. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. His love motivated giving. So with that reality in mind, here's the first thing that Proverbs 3.9 tells us. Everything we are and everything we have is given for us to honor the Lord. And I'm serious, but now you could just start taking inventory. I mean, it's in your mind. Maybe you have it in your back pocket written down or on your phone. But listen, everything that you have and everything that you are is given to you for the purpose of honoring the Lord. That's why you live and breathe. That's why he made you. And before we can define what it means for us to give, we have to understand the Lord's purpose in giving. First of all, everything we are and have is given to us with purpose in mind. And he says it right there, to honor the Lord. Now, honoring the Lord with your wealth means just that. That we, we use the word wealth and immediately we go to wealthy. You know, we think that anytime we see the word wealth, it's somebody who's rich. And a lot of times then we just disqualify ourselves from that con conversation. You know, this verse is not about me because it has the word wealth in it and I don't have any wealth. Well, actually, if you look at the original language, Hebrews, Hebrew of the Old Testament, and even when it's used in the New Testament in the original language of Greek, both of those words mean all of you. All of you. So when he says, honor the Lord with your wealth, he's saying, honor the Lord with all of you. Not just your stuff, not just your money, but also your abilities and your time. Everything that you are. And it's interesting when you say that because little or much, every single person here with us today and online has wealth. You have wealth. And it's important to get that. Because what we like to do then is say to our mind, it all belongs to the Lord, but then we start thinking about the portion that belongs to the Lord. When in fact, all of it belongs to the Lord. It's not like here in the church we say, okay, this portion belongs to us, and then you, you use all of that for yourself, there you go. No, it all belongs to him. And so when you give to the church, for instance, and I always think about this in terms of how we budget the offerings of the people to our church, and you, we recognize that our leaders are in charge of how those monies are spent. So we have elders, we have staff, and they're all a part of determining the offerings that you give, how they're used in work and ministry. But they don't belong to us. They belong to the Lord. And so we're always very careful about that. We take that very seriously, that when we put a budget together, this isn't just some way to spend money and have fun. No, every penny of it was given by somebody who was honoring the Lord with it. And so when you remember this, it removes your concern about affording anything. Because you will always be able to afford that which God calls you to do. He'll provide it. Because you now understand that none of it really belongs to you anyway. Everything you have, he's now charged to you like a manager in a store. You know, that manager doesn't look at that money as, as his or her own. They manage that store well in the same way with all that you've been given. It's been given to you so that God can be lifted up. Giving is simply you carrying out the distribution of your wealth as an expression of worship, thanksgiving, and faith. That's why the proverb writer wrote that. It's all there to what? Honor the Lord. Now, Solomon even specifically helps us with that budgeting process. If you thought that first point was a high bar, wait till you see what he takes us to next. Let's read the same verse again. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Now, I want you to think about that because this was an agrarian society for the most part. Everything was done with, you know, cattle or, or crops or, or everything had to do with that was where their money was for the most part. And he says, look, I'm just going to put it in that perspective. Whatever you raise, you bring the first and the best to the Lord because we bring the best we have to honor the Lord. That's what honors him, is our very first and best. 
the best part of everything you produce, he said. Now, when they brought a sacrifice to the temple for worship, then it had to be their first and their best. And so if a person had a sheep that they were bringing for a sacrifice, they didn't say, which one will I make the least amount of money on, and that's the one I'm bringing. No, they picked out the absolute pure sheep, pure lamb without a spot or blemish on it. And they brought that for the sacrifice. If, if they couldn't afford those kind of things, like animal sacrifices, they brought their best dove, or they brought their best grain. Whatever it was, they brought their first, and they brought their best. Now, whatever they brought, it was absolutely the first and best because God set it up that way to help them appreciate what their giving was all about. Their giving was meant to honor the God of the universe, the God who created them. You know, I guarantee you that there were not Hebrews sitting around the, the village saying to themselves, oh man, all those people at that temple do is ask for money. All those people do is want what they always want. And not only do they want my money, they want my best. They want my first. None of them were saying that because they understood this concept was that it was God that they were giving this sacrifice to. Now, some might say to themselves, well, yeah, but that's the Old Testament, and we don't follow that anymore. Well, I'm glad you pointed that out, because I'm going to show you where eh, it might be a little different than what you just said. Hebrew people operated on the concept that they were to bring the first tenth of everything they owned to the Lord and to the temple for the purpose of, the wor of worship and for the purpose of helping the needy in the community through the temple's ministries. So that was called the tithe. And a lot of people will say, yeah, but see, that was an Old Testament concept. And I'll, and I'll say to you, okay, why don't we read what Jesus had to say about it? Because last time I checked, Jesus was in the New Testament. And, and he was talking to a bunch of prideful, arrogant religious leaders when he said this recorded in Matthew 23 23 what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees hypocrites for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens but you ignore the more important aspects of the law justice mercy and faith you should tithe yes but do not neglect the more important things you see, Jesus was affirming the practice of tithing to the temple and to the worship and to the service of the community while at the same time raising the bar on concepts like justice, mercy, and faith. It wasn't either or. Both of these things were important to Jesus. So the tithe being the first and the best of my wealth serves this work of ministry and it brings honor to God. Now, how does a person do that? Um, I, I am going to talk to you now from a little bit of fear and trembling because I, I didn't know any way, other way to do it but just say to you, I'm going to show you how Stephanie and I do it. And so I'm going to put it right up in front of you and say we work in percentages. And, and so we have to make a decision about what's most important. And so this year we have a wedding and it, it's taking money to put it on and we're having a great time doing it but we had to set aside money for that purpose and so you see other stuff there housing that kind of takes it all in so everything from from what we pay for the house to what uh what we do with utilities and upkeep maintenance everything that has to do insurance all that stuff is in that housing part of the pie there and vacations and, and life this is not meant to be a template for you it's merely to say we are intentional about the stuff and the wealth God has entrusted to us in our life. Now, you'll see down there, um, or, or up there, excuse me, in the upper left uh, quadrant there in that purple giving at, at, at 14%. Now, here, when I told Stephanie, when we, got, when we were getting married, when we got engaged, I said, look, if, if, th if this is a deal breaker for you, I got to know now. I tithe. So the first 10%, is going to go to whatever church it is we're going to. doesn't belong to us. That's money that God's given us to entrust to our storehouse or our church. So I just want you to know that's, that's the case. And she was like, I'm all about that. 
So, you know, I married somebody who's also a tither. And, and so we start there. Our budgeting starts foundationally with a tithe. And then after that, if the Lord enables us to give more, which this past year, that's what that is, that's a roundup of 2023, we were able to give more than the tithe because he provided more in different ways that we never expected. Here at Southland, we call that faith promise, and we give that to missions so that we can specifically help people in need. So I'm, I'm just showing this to you not to say, hey, look, see, look what we do. No, I'm showing it to you to say, look, it can be done. If you'll do it intentionally and start right now, today, taking inventory of all you have, little or much. Now, here's, here's the thing. Here's what I, I understand, is that ultimately, if you never get started, you never will start. Now, what I mean by it, it sounds deep, I know, but, but what it means is simply this. I'm not saying you have to start with tithing if you just absolutely in no way, shape, or form are in a position of that, but I think that your goal or your dream or your aspiration should be to get there because this is what he asks of us who follow him, and it is an incredible joy to give it every time we give it, and so just start with something. You know, if it's five bucks or if it's a hundred bucks, just start with something that you're giving, whether it's it's, it's here, and, and I hope we would be able to use it well, and you could trust us with it, or whether it's some ministry that you know of, like the Refuge or Hope Center or OMS or somebody who's helping people, just give and make sure you set aside a portion for that purpose so that it's your first and it's your best. Start there and then live off of the rest. Choose your style of living off of what remains. However, never forget, it all belongs to the Lord. Now, it's not only our money, but also our time and our resources and our energy and our talents. I mean, how can I give the best of all I am to the Lord? I mean, let's, let's use that time thing, for example. I mean, let's, let's face it. You, you have, you go to, if you work, you go to work, and that's a certain number of hours uh, per day or per week. Most of you need to sleep. Most of you do. And so there's sleep in that budgeted amount of time. But then there's the rest. There's the rest of that time. How am I using my discretionary time to bring honor to the Lord? See, but a lot of times we just use it to play or whatever. And you, we do need to rest, and we do need to read, and we do need to get our minds right. All of that is good. And we should be intersecting and interacting with our family and our close friends and other people that hold us accountable. But the bottom line is, do I even take inventory of my time? Do I think about how I use my time in terms of bringing honor and glory to the Lord? So I want to encourage you today to review all of your resources and make a decision you know, budgeting might be the most spiritual thing you've ever done. Because it's interesting how often Jesus talked about the way we use our wealth. And how will I budget my time and, and, and wealth to specifically honor the Lord? Now, here's the thing. Solomon offers this wisdom with a promise. And that's what's really important. Let's read verse 10. It follows right after what he said. Then he will fill your barns with grain, and your vats will overflow with good wine. You see, here's his promise to us, is that the Lord will provide everything we need to bring him honor. Now, I'll be honest with you, a lot of preachers, a lot of teachers will read that verse right there and say, if you'll give to the Lord, then he'll make you rich. That's not what this passage is saying at all. Not even close. No, what he is saying in context is that the Lord will give you all you need to carry out whatever it is he's calling you to do with the resources he's provided. So he will also guide you on how to use those resources and where they should be allocated in terms of time and money and effort. So whether your barn is big or your barn is small, he will fill it so that you can be faithful and, here it is, generous. 
generous with whatever it is he's entrusted to you. This has the opportunity to powerfully and positively elevate your goals from accumulating and consuming to accumulating and serving. I mean, I want to accumulate all that I can so that I can give all that I can to others who need it to be blessed and to be helped. You know, it's interesting. Jesus said, whatever you've done for these, the least of my brothers, you've done for me. And that's why generosity is an act of worship. Because when I look into your eyes and I see your need and I want to immediately meet it with what God has given to me, that is worshiping Jesus according to what Jesus said in his word. That means our attitudes, our words, our behaviors toward the needs of people are the evidence of his spirit being alive in our hearts. You know, I just let, let, let me just tell you what I mean by that. Encouragement is free. You realize that, right? I mean, you can take two seconds and find somebody who's discouraged and encourage them. You can find wonderful things to compliment and uplift other people. And that is as if you're giving an offering to God. And it doesn't cost you anything but the time you took to give it. Think about that. Because unfortunately, oftentimes, we're doing a whole lot more withdrawals than we are deposits. Oftentimes, we're tearing people down instead of saying, I have this tremendous opportunity with my voice and my care and my words to bless and encourage and uplift another human being. But no matter what size our barns, he fills them with what we need, and frankly, he says, and more to demonstrate our desire to follow his example, his spirit, his wisdom, and his commands. We trust him. You know, and I have to be honest with you. I mean, when I look in the mirror every day, I have to ask that guy standing there looking back at me, do you really trust him? Do you really trust him enough to be generous with all that he's given to you? We teach a course here at Southland called Financial Peace University, and inevitably, the times I've taught it, everyone in the room is massively in debt. And the whole reason they're taking the course is because they want to get out of debt. Now, here's the thing. The whole purpose, though, of the course isn't to get you out of debt so you have more money to spend. The whole point of it is to get you out of debt so that you're in a place now where you can be generous and you can give to your church and you can give to other ministries and you can give to people that god brings into your life that need your help giving is the goal of budgeting and the removal of debt so that's why i'm saying i understand you, know, you made decisions somewhere in your past and now you find yourself buried under debt and perhaps that you chose a standard of living that might have been a little bit more expensive than what has been provided to you i get all of that and the whole point is then okay get working on that debt so that you can get working on your giving and in giving you will experience the joy of the lord now remember Jesus spoke more about possessions and wealth than anything else except, believe it or not, hell. He spoke about possessions and wealth all the time, and it's recorded in his word. And here's one example from Matthew chapter 6. Here's what he said. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be. And so when I'm looking at that guy in the mirror, I have to ask him honestly every day, what is it that you treasure the most? And what will you do today with all that you are and all that you have to tell the truth and prove that he has all of your heart. 
Because he's saying that what we prioritize is the evidence of what indeed is most important to us. And one more thing. Remember, the Proverbs are all about gaining wisdom. That's what we're going for here. And Solomon was encouraging us to pursue wisdom with all our heart. Honoring the Lord with all our wealth requires discipline, which Solomon also encourages in Proverbs. And you're like, Sheldon, if it wasn't bad enough, you're talking to me about giving my money, now you're going to use that awful word discipline as well? Exactly. Because disciplining our lives is an opportunity to say to the Lord, I'm putting it all in order so that it all goes to your glory. So the call to respond today is a call to receive wisdom, and with that wisdom, decide to give and to honor the Lord. Jesus and Solomon and the entire Bible focus on having a giving spirit, and I'm not afraid to tell you that. And God bless all the other preachers that shake when they're talking about giving. I want you to experience the incredible joy that comes from generosity. And I want to encourage you to believe that his word is true and that can happen in your life. And maybe today, you would start even right now making a decision to putting yourself a budget together, both for money and for time. And you'd say to yourself, I'm going to let the Lord fill in the columns. And that way, he gets all the glory. Let's pray together. So, Lord, that's my, my prayer. I'm deciding right now that I want to reflect your generosity in my life. I want to give like you gave to me, sacrificially and with a heart of love and joy. So today, right now in this moment, I'm giving you all of me, my time, my stuff, my abilities, myself. And I'm asking you, Lord, to wash me of selfishness and replace it all with a deep desire to reflect your beautiful love, grace, and mercy in my life. Show me how to do that. Go ahead, you pray your own prayer in response to what you heard today. Receive his grace and mercy and then ask him to show you how to use all that you are for his glory. You pray. You pray. Jesus, thank you so much for giving to us. Thank you so much for sacrificing for us. So Lord, show us, help us to believe that living for you is what we were made for. And living for you is the best possible life. Fill our hearts with the same generosity you showed when you gave yourself for us. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, it, there's no better way than to think about and respond to his challenge on giving by, than by thinking about all he gave for us. So let's stand, let's worship him for who he is and what he's done, and let his glory be first and foremost on your heart this morning.
beyond campaign where we said you know we have a dream to pay all of this off uh, in in five years and it, it's beautiful five years from when we took the mortgage on it and when the whole thing started it was 6.5 million dollars to build the space so that we could worship and grow and and listen in just eight years we now only owe 1.799 million dollars that is definitely generous giving and I'm so grateful that you pray about that and you give. And I still have a dream that it's all gone by June 4th of this year. And it'll take a miracle. But I'm looking for that miracle. I'm praying for that miracle. And I'm grateful for your generosity in it. And you as well who are with us online, thank you so much for being part of the service. Let's stick around for just a minute. Hannah's going to talk a little bit more about how you can respond to what you experienced today here in worship at Southland. God bless you. Have a great week. Look forward to seeing you again next week.